Hello, this is Crystal Stanich, and thank you for joining me for this week's First Chapter Friday. Today, I will be reading the first chapter of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Hope you enjoy. Chapter 1. A squat gray building of only 34 stories. Over the main entrance, the words, Central London Hatchery and Conditioning Center, and in a shield, the world state's motto, community, identity, stability. The enormous room on the ground floor faced towards the north, cold for all the summer beyond the panes, for all the tropical heat of the room itself, a harsh, thin light glared through the windows, hungrily seeking some draped lay figure, some pallid shape of academic goose flesh. But finding only the glass and nickel and bleakly shining porcelain of a laboratory, wintriness responded to wintriness. The overalls of the workers were white, their hands gloved with a pale corpse-colored rubber. The light was frozen, dead, a ghost. Only from the yellow barrels of the microscopes did it borrow a certain rich and living substance, lying along the polished tubes like butter. Streak after luscious streak in long recession down the work tables. And this, said the director, opening the door, is the fertilizing room. Bent over their instruments, 300 fertilizers were plunged as the director of hatcheries and conditioning entered the room. In the scarcely breathing silence, the absent-minded, soliloquizing hum or whistle of observed concentration, a troop of newly arrived students, very young, pink and callow, followed nervously, rather abjectly, at the director's heels. Each of them carried a notebook in which, whenever the great man spoke, he desperately scribbled, straight from the horse's mouth. It was a rare privilege. The DHC for Central London always made a point of personally conducting his new students round the various departments. Just to give you a general idea, he would explain to them. For, of course, some sort of general idea they must have if they were to do their work intelligently. Though, as little of one, if they were to be good and happy members of society as possible. For particulars, as everyone knows, make for virtue and happiness. Generalities are intellectually necessary evils. Not philosophers, but fret sawyers and stamp collectors compose the backbone of society. Tomorrow, he would add, smiling at them with a slightly menacing geniality, you'll be settling down to serious work you won't have time for generalities. Meanwhile, meanwhile, it was a privilege. Straight from the horse's mouth into the notebook, the boys scribbled like mad. Tall and rather thin, but upright, the director advanced into the room. He had a long chin and big, rather prominent teeth, just covered when he was not talking by his full floridly curved lips. Old? Young? 30? 50? 55? It was hard to say. And anyhow, the question didn't arise in this year of stability, AF 632. It didn't occur to you to ask it. I shall begin at the beginning, said the DHC, and the more zealous students recorded his intention in their notebooks. Begin at the beginning. These, he waved his hand, are the incubators. And opening an insulated door, he showed them racks upon racks of numbered test tubes. The weak supply of ova, kept, he explained, at blood heat, whereas the male 
gametes, and here he opened another door. They have to be kept at 35 instead of 37. Full blood heat sterilizes. Rams wrapped in thermogene beget no lambs. Still leaning against the incubators, he gave them. While the pencils scurried illegibly across the pages, a brief description of the modern fertilizing process spoke first, of course, of its surgical introduction. The operation undergone voluntarily for the good of society, not to mention the fact that it carries a bonus amounting to six months salary, continued with some account of the technique for preserving the excised ovary alive and actively developing, passed on to a consideration of optimum temperature, salinity, viscosity, referred to the liquor in which the detached and ripened eggs were kept, and leading his charges to the work tables, actually showed them how this liquor was drawn off from the test tubes, how it was let out drop by drop onto the specially worn slides of the microscopes, how the eggs which it contained were inspected for abnormalities, counted and transferred to a porous receptacle. How? And he now took them to watch the operation. This receptacle was immersed in a warm bouillon containing free-swimming spermatozoa at a minimum concentration of 100,000 per cubic centimeter. He insisted. And how, after 10 minutes, the container was lifted out of the liquor and its contents re-examined. How, if any of the eggs remained unfertilized, it was again immersed, and, if necessary, yet again. How the fertilized ova went back to the incubators where the alphas and betas remained until definitely bottled, while the gammas, deltas, and epsilons were brought out again only after 36 hours to undergo Bokanovsky's process. Bokanovsky's process, repeated the director, and the students underlined the words in their little notebooks. One egg, one embryo, one adult, normality. But a Bokanovskified egg will bud, will proliferate, will divide. From eight to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo, and every embryo into a full-sized adult, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before. Progress. Essentially, the DHC concluded, Bokanovskification consists of a series of arrests of development. We check the normal growth and, paradoxically enough, the egg responds by budding. Responds by budding. The pencils were busy. He pointed. On a very slowly moving band, a rack full of test tubes was entering a large metal box. Another rack full was emerging. Machinery faintly poured. It took eight minutes for the tubes to go through, he told them. Eight minutes of hard x-rays, being about as much as an egg can stand. A few died. Of the rest, the least susceptible divided into two. Most put out four buds. Some eight. All were returned to the incubators, where the buds began to develop. Then, after two days, were suddenly chilled. Chilled and checked. Two, four, eight. The buds in their turn bud, and having budded, were dosed almost to death with alcohol. Consequently, burgeoned again and having budded, bud out of bud out of bud, were thereafter, for their arrest being generally fatal, left to develop in peace, by which time the original egg was in a fair way to becoming anything from 8 to 96 embryos. A prodigious improvement, you will agree, on nature. Identical twins, 
but not in piddling twos and threes, as in the old viviparous days, when an egg would sometimes accidentally divide, actually by dozens, by scores at a time. Scores, the director repeated and flung out his arms, as though he were distributing largesse, scores. But one of the students was full enough to ask where the advantage lay. My good boy, the director wheeled sharply round on him. Can't you see? Can't you see? He raised a hand. His expression was solemn. Bokanovsky's process is one of the major instruments of social stability. Major instruments of social stability. Standard men and women in uniform batches. The whole of a small factory staffed with the products of a single Bokanovskified egg. 96 identical twins working 96 identical machines. The voice was almost tremulous with enthusiasm. You really know where you are for the first time in history. He quoted the planetary motto, community, identity, stability. Grand words. If we could Bokanovskify indefinitely, the whole problem would be solved. Solved by standard gammas, unvarying deltas, uniform epsilons, millions of identical twins. The principle of mass production at last applied to biology. But alas, the director shook his head. We can't Bokanovskify indefinitely. And that is the beginning of chapter one of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. If you would like to know what happens next in this dystopian novel, check the book out on Hoopla. Thank you and have a great day.